start by saying my name is Maurice Podbury and I was born at a very young age in Durban. And I was asked to talk about my life in South Africa and the growing up years. It coincided rather interestingly with my reading of two books. Two books. The first one uh, was a novel by Anthony Scher. Uh, Anthony Scher was a young boy growing up in Sea Point, South Africa, Cape Town. He made his way to England, became an actor, did very well, ended up becoming knighted, Sir Anthony Scher. And he wrote a couple of novels, very interesting novels, but he made an extraordinary confession on one of them, which really amazed me. He said that growing up in Sea Point, in the 50s and 60s, 60s, he was quite unaware of any racial situation in this country. And only when he went to England <laughs> and found the turmoil that was going there and the protests, he re realized he had come from a country that was seriously divided and in trouble. And he tried to adjust accordingly. Well, this, uh, I found it a little bit unbelievable that someone could grow up in those years but I checked around and I found many young people growing up in Seapoint had exactly that experience. I think it's attributable to the fact that there were very few black people living in Seapoint in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Cape Town remains to this day, I think, a very divided city, uh, the least integrated city in the country. Well, uh, and Nanteen Show was a product of that. That was the one book. The other book is an unpublished book written by my brother, my brother Joe, who passed on about 10 years ago. And he wrote a slightly fictionalized account of a young man called John Harris. I don't know how many of you will recognize his name, but John Harris was hanged in Pretoria Central Prison at the age of 27 for planting a bomb in a railway station in Johannesburg. In, yeah. Uh, which ended up uh, uh, sadly killing an elderly white woman who was arrested, imprisoned, and hanged. Apparently he went to the gallows singing, We Shall Overcome. It's a very powerful story, and my brother captures it marvelously. The book is unpublished, and I hope it will be published one day, because it tells a story that needs to be heard. So these two people, John Harris and uh, Anthony Scher, in a way, reflect the 50s for me, growing up in South Africa at that time. I also actually left South Africa and became an actor in England, and uh, didn't achieve the heights that uh, Anthony Scher did, but he did quite well. Actually, I even acted on the Stratford stage in England, where he had done his remarkable Richard III which earned him the knighthood. I was touring with a farce called Simple Spyman. And the uh, Stratford stage was available for a week. And we rented it and put the play on there. And I played the part of a, a Turk, Turkish uh, carpet salesman who goes around advertising pile restorers, which the MI5 thought to be connected to an atomic bomb and so on. So he's followed. Uh, everywhere, and I didn't know what a Turkish accent was when I went for the audition. I said, could I come back after lunch and do the audition then? They said, yeah, sure. So I ran up across Trafalgar Square into Soho, and I saw Turkish Cypriot Association. I went on there, and there were these bearded, heavy-set guys playing with blocks of wood. And, so, and I said, can you tell me, uh, I wonder what the Turkish accent is. Me, me, I got no accent. Him, he got accent. So I took this and I ran all the way back, got on the stage, and got the part. Uh, so I spent 10 years in England before going first to Canada and continuing my life there. But coming back to South Africa, my life in South Africa, unlike that of Anthony Scher, was intensely political. I couldn't escape it. My family was deeply, deeply involved. My father, mother, brother, and sister had come over from Lithuania in the early 30s. Uh, my father had belonged to a thing called the Bund, 
which was a Jewish sort of communist organization in Eastern Europe. My brother and sister grew, um, they arrived here when they were nine, ten years old, but my sister immediately became political. At the age of 16, she was already a trade union agitator. Uh, she joined the Communist Party. She married an Indian, which in those days was quite a thing to do, especially in the little Jewish community of Durban, you can imagine. Um, she went to Cape Town, uh, became the secretary of the Sweet Workers Union. Uh, they were both banned, her to Cape Town, he to Durban. He, is, he was H.A. Naidu, a remarkable figure. Uh, they were forced into exile. My brother was in the war, the Second World War. He served in North Africa. He came back and was a member of the Springbok Legion, which was an ex-servicemen's organization, very political and again, very radical. He spent a few months in prison during the 1960s. Um, uh, uh, what was it called? The 1960 um, uh, public speaking was bad. Uh, it was the security measure by the government, and he, he was in prison for three months in, in, uh, in the Northern Cape where he was living at the time. So. I grew up in this political surround in Durban, which was the least attractive place to grow up in. I can't tell you how unattractive Durban was at that time. It was, uh, they claimed uh, to have invented apartheid. Who are these Afrikaners who think they invented apartheid? We invented apartheid. Of course, ours is directed more towards the Indian community, that is our economic competitor. But blacks never even figured in the equation there. Anyway, I was very glad to get out of Durban, went to Johannesburg, and breathed. It was marvelous. Uh, I didn't know what to do, but I got a bursary, and I thought I'll go to you Wits and become a lawyer. After one year of thinking I was going to become a lawyer, I bumped into Brown Fisher on a Joburg Street, who said to me, young man, what are you going to do for a living? And I said, I I'm going to be a lawyer, thinking, just like you, you know. He says, ah, oh, man, it's a terrible profession. You'll be grubbing for other people's money. There's no dignity in it. Totally demolished any idea of what law might be. And so I registered for the teacher's training college in the morning, and I did a degree at WITS, and uh, ended up becoming a teacher. But it was those years at WITS that were so formative and exciting and interesting, to a point. And that's where the story of John Harris comes into play. Witts and, and uh, UCT were the two open universities at that time. Eh? And so for anybody coming to Witts, it was a new experience, mixing across the races. And it was a hotbed of political activism among young people. I was a member of a student liberal association, which was only liberal in name, but was actually pretty left-wing and pro-Congress. And we held meetings and lectures and films and, and went into town and did demos. And uh, uh, in the morning paper had me climbing up a pole in the, in, in the front of the city hall in Durban, where we held the demonstration and the police charged with batons. And somehow, I managed to climb this pillar. I went to check it out the, other, the following day and it was impossible. It was too broad, but there I was halfway up this pillar in this photograph. I was also active in, in what was an association to the ANC, it was called the Congress of Democrats. It was in a white, white grouping of people who swore allegiance to the ANC. And uh, we did modest things. We, we sold newspapers. In fact, I spent Sundays and Saturdays selling The Guardian, which is an ANC paper, in, uh, in, in Sophia Town and Alexander Township. That was quite an experience, going to the door, knocking on the door. A little kid would come up, and I'd hear the shout, Om Long. And uh, the father would come up and look at me curiously. We'd have a chat. And, he might or might not buy the paper. But that was the quality of one's political involvement. 
It was very intense. We thought it was very intense. It was radical. We thought it was very radical. In fact, it was neither. It was peripheral. It was a world apart from what was really going on in South Africa. And John Harris's story captures that spirit very keenly. He was a member of the Liberal Party and had an association, a group of young men and women who were like-minded. But within a short period of time, they began to fall away. And he realized that the political life at that time was being white and being an activist was almost irrelevant. Uh, you could not impinge on the reality of what was going on in South Africa. The apartheid regime was so powerful and so extreme. They were picking up people all over the place. They were dismembering organizations before they could even get started. In the Congress of Democrats, which I mentioned that I was a member of, Pete Bailefeld was also there. He turned out to be a police spy. So they knew everything that was going on. John Harris describes this very, very well. The suffocation of growing up in South Africa and being impotent, wanting to do something, wanting to make a mark, to make a statement, and being, in a sense, deprived of that opportunity. And I remember that feeling very well. It was a cause of deep depression. Some days I'd even end up in tears, not knowing what the hell I could do, what, I, what was possible, what was not possible. And I eventually left the country and went to England and then went to Canada and spent 40 years abroad. That was my, because I realized that to take that next step, to commit myself to radical politics, revolutionary politics, would mean exactly what happened to John Harris. I would be making a statement of that kind. John Harris decided to stay and make that statement and he was hanged for it. I left the country and spent 40 years abroad and came back in 97 when things had somewhat changed in this country. I'm happy to be back. And um, that was the feeling of the life of a young white Jewish kid growing up in the 50s in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you.